Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to have you turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Okay, to begin with, I want you to understand that the position of the book of Acts, even though the New Testament is not necessarily written chronologically, as you understand, the book of Acts is put in a perfect position because you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, which are one dispensation, and you have Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, the epistles, which is a different dispensation. We're looking at two different dispensations, even though the time period of the book of Acts fits in at the time period of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're, the, we're talking of the same time period, but a big difference because the book of Acts is a transition period between one dispensation and another dispensation. The book of, books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written primarily to the church. They were written primarily to the Jews. They were books that concer concerned the kingdom message. You can understand that. When we look at it, there's so many different dispensations and people look at it and say, I don't like this idea of dispensations. Dispensationalism is not popular today. We do not find people who want to talk about dispensations. Covenant theology has become very, very popular in our world, but dispensationalism has really fallen aside. People don't like it. They want the entire Bible written to me. They want the entire Bible written about Jesus. They want the same thing, but... The primary teaching of the Bible is written to Jewish people. The primary, the, the bulk of the Bible is written to Jewish people. When you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is written concerning promises to the 12 tribes of Israel. It is not that they don't apply to us, but they're not primarily written to us. They're written a judgment about Israel, about their failure to keep the, the covenants of God and how God would judge them in the dispersion the Babylonian captivity, how he would bring them back, how he would set up a kingdom for them in the future. And God is not replacing Israel with the church. There are a number of difference, dip, different dispensational differences in this passage, and I want to share these with you to begin with. First of all, in the message of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the message was not the same message that we are given today. John the Baptist preached and he said, Preach, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <coughs> the kingdom message was, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus Christ preached, he said, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see the same message. But when we come to the, to the Gospels, Jesus did not say to us, go ye into all the world and preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, preach the gospel, the good news. The gospel means good news. Euangelion is translated gospel, you meaning good, angelion meaning message. You see the word angel in there, an angel is a messenger. Euangelion means a good message. I want you to go into all the world and preach a good message. Well, the kingdom of heaven is at hand was not necessarily a good message. The kingdom of heaven that is at hand is about God's judgment on this earth. But what's fascinating about that is that message never came to pass. It never came to fruition. Why? Because it's been 2,000 years and the kingdom still has not come. When we look in the beginning of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <coughs> Jesus, John the Baptist, the disciples, they preached this message saying, the kingdom of heaven is near at hand. And so the disciples are really confused because at the end of Jesus' ministry, He dies. He comes back from the dead. In the beginning of Acts, they say to Him, wait a second, you told us that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And so in the beginning of the book of Acts, he says, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom? If it's at hand, where's the kingdom? The kingdom was all about Jesus being the king on the earth, setting up a kingdom in Jerusalem as the capital of the entire world in Jerusalem. The Jewish people having authority in this kingdom and, <laughs> you remember, you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He said that to the disciples. 12 thrones. Where are the 12 thrones? You said the kingdom of heaven is at hand and yet it's been 2,000 years and we still don't have a kingdom. <clears throat> the covenant theologians say, well, that's because we are the kingdom. We are the kingdom and Jesus Christ reigns on this earth through us. And if you've watched the Supreme Court lately, if you've watched the Congress lately, you know that God is not reigning on the earth at this time. Whether it's in the church or without the church, God is not reigning. There's no kingdom on the earth at this time. So what is the message today? Wilt thou again restore the kingdom to Israel? The message today, of course, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to see it, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 50. Moreover, brethren, I declare the gospel unto you all. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Moreover, brethren, I declare the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. I'm going to declare it to you. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear what that gospel message is. Okay, the second difference, dispensational difference, is in the audience. When you talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, listen to this. These 12 Jesus, let me go back again. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded, saying, Go not into the way of Gentiles or into any of the city of the Samaritans. Don't enter, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is written to the Israelites. It's written to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You say, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Well, there was this Syrophoenician woman that came to Jesus and said, Lord, help me. My daughter is demon-possessed. Come and cast the demon out of her. And Jesus made this statement, which is amazing. It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. He says it right to the woman. If you were to do that today, what would you be accused of? I mean, this would be considered a racial slur. Would you not agree? <clears throat> that is a real strong statement. The Syrophoenician woman is not Jewish. She wants Jesus' help. <coughs> and Jesus said, it's not meat, it's not fitting to take the meat or the bread that's for the children and give it to the dogs. But the woman answered Jesus and said, Yea, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumb which fall from the children's table. And Jesus looked at her and said, For this saying, go your way, your daughter's whole. Because he saw in this woman a tremendous amount of faith. <clears throat> However, the gospel message Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was not given, was not presented to the, Jew, to the Gentiles at all. It was given to the Jewish people. You know, <clears throat> this is a real strange thing. When you're studying the Bible and you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is not about the church at all, it's not about us, it's about the Israelites, it's about Jewish people. John 1.1, 1, 1, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. It's all about the gospel message going to the Jewish people, and they rejected it. They rejected the gospel message. They rejected Jesus Christ. And in Romans 11.25, it says this, For I would not, brethren, have you, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Here's what you have. The kingdom is presented to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's presented to the Jewish people. But they rejected it. They would not have this man reign over them. They would not have Jesus Christ become their king. And so God has set that kingdom aside for a period of time, and He's called out of the Gentiles a people for His name. 
And so in this, it's almost a quandary, of course, for us to understand it, but in this time period, God is dealing with Gentiles, and the Jewish people are in blindness today, awaiting the kingdom, but they're in blindness today. Blindness has happened because we are in a time when the fullness of the Gentiles God is bringing into a, into a, a different thing called the church. When you take the book of Acts, Acts is really divided up into the ministry to the Jewish people and the ministry to the Gentiles. The first 12 chapters of of Acts deals with Peter. The last part of the book of Acts deals with Paul. Paul makes it very clear that Peter is an apostle to the circumcision. And Paul makes it clear that he is an apostle to the uncircumcision, to the Gentiles. Listen to this verse. I'm sorry, that's not, that's not the verse I was looking at. Um, lost my train of thought here. Let me get back to this. It, back what we were talking about is blindness in part has happened to Israel. God is not dealing with Israel right now, but it's very clear. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The message that God has given to us is not for the just Jewish people, it's for the entire world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not just limited to Israel. When you talk about this, it says in the Bible, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the, pos- for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, to the Gentile. God has put aside Israel and he's working with the Gentiles. Let me see if I can find the verse. Here, here's the verse I wanted to share with you right now. It's Acts 13, 46. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy to everlasting life, we turn to the Gentiles. That is what happened historically. The Jewish people, they rejected the message. And in Acts 13, we have a big transition that takes place. Acts 1 through 12 is about Peter. Acts chapter 13 begins talking about Paul. And there's a change in Acts when it goes from the Jews to the Gentiles. Now, (coughs) in order for us to understand the book of Acts, the transition book of Acts, You have to understand this. The Jewish people hated the Gentiles. The Jewish people did not feel that the Gentiles were worthy to have everlasting life. They were not part of the Jewish covenants. They were not part of circumcision. The Jewish people did not want Gentiles in the church. They only wanted Jewish people in the church. God is going to start this new thing, and he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says that before the church begins. But when you begin in the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 12, they don't go into all the world and preach the gospel. They only preach to the Jewish people. And so, when you talk about the beginning of the book of Acts, all of the first Christians were all Jewish There are no Gentiles yet. They're all Jewish people. All of the people are proselytized Jews. They're Jewish people from every nation under heaven. They have come together. They hear tongues. They hear the tongue spoken. They accept Christ. But they're all Jewish. (coughs) They have a real difficult time with Samaritans. They have a very difficult time with Gentiles. And they're not going to accept them into the church. And so one of the things that's critically important in the book of Acts, God has got to find a way in the book of Acts to get the Jewish people to understand that the church is not just Jews, but Jew and Gentile together. And he does some amazing things in this book to bring the body of Christ together in Jew and Gentile in one body. To break down the middle wall of partition that's existing between them. Let me go back now and let me show you the difference in the methods In the methods, when we talk about the different methods, the Bible says in Matthew 10, 8, 
heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out de demons, freely receive, freely give, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his hire, worthy of his meat. The, the methods that they used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were totally different. Now, <laughs> in the church today, they want to incorporate those methods. The charismatics want to heal the sick, they want to raise the dead, they want to cleanse, cast out demons, but that's not the methods that God has given to us today in the church. That was a method that he used back in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that's not the method of the church. You can understand that it's a whole lot easier to raise people from sickness than it is to raise them from the dead. You don't have a lot of charismatics raising people from the dead because that's a lot harder. But in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they raise people from the dead. What's very fascinating is that if you're going to really hold to the methodology of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're not doing it for money. You're not asking for money. Right? You're to take no money with you, no silver, no gold, and God is going to be the one providing your needs here. It's not going to be a money-based religion that we've seen so much of in the world in the last 50 years. Did God ask us to raise the dead today? Did He ask us to cast out demons today? Did He ask us to heal the sick? Did He say, take no money? Is that what He is asking us to do? When you get to the end of the book of Luke, then He said to them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. Likewise a script, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. There is a change that takes place. Bring your purse with you. <coughs> Bring your money with you now. If you miss this, you miss dispensational teaching. He says back in, in Matthew chapter 10, do not take money with you. But when you get to Luke chapter 22 at the end of the book, he says, yes, now take money with you. So there's a change here in his methodology from Matthew chapter 10 to Luke chapter 22 as he prepares for the time period that we're living in. If it's always God's will that people are healed, if it's always God's will that people are healed, why does God not heal Timothy? Paul says to Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and your often infirmities. What do you mean often infirmities? The charismatics say this, by his stripes you are healed. God is not ever wanting people to be sick. God does not want you sick. It's not His will that you're sick. The only reason you're sick is because you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you would not be sick. The charismatics are strong in saying that it is not God's will that any be sick. Therefore, if you get rid of the sin in your life, you will be healed. It's just a question of sin. And no one ever has to be sick. But here is one of the key men in the Bible that is really having a problem with sickness. And Paul says to him, Hey, where's your faith? Why don't you just go get yourself healed? He doesn't say that because that's not the time period we're living in. In the time period of the, of the Jewish economy, they laid their hands on you, you would be healed. But when you come into the church period, listen to me carefully. Paul asked the Lord three times to bring this, take this infirmity from me, this thorn in the flesh. And what did God say? No. I'm not going to take it from you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I take joy in my infirmities, my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest upon you. My grace is sufficient for you. As I mentioned now, it's a transition between the Jew first and also to the Greek. People are really afraid of dispensational teaching, <coughs> but all it's saying is this. There are different portions of the Bible that are spoken to different people. 
And God has set aside something different now. He has chosen a people of Israel, or chosen a people of the, of the nations of the Gentiles to be a church. And now we're turning to the Gentiles. Now I want you to understand in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 15, the Jewish people were so strong on this that they did not like Gentiles. They felt Gentiles were unclean and they felt that in order for a person, you and I, to be saved, we had to first become Jewish. You had to become Jewish before you could be saved. So in chapter 15 of Acts, there's this huge, huge debate. No, they have to be circumcised first because Gentiles are not worthy to be saved. They've got to become Jewish first. So in Acts chapter 15, they come together to consider this matter. Do they have to keep the law? Do they have to become circumcised? And this is a huge debate. They didn't know what to think at the time. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised, <coughs> become Jewish, after the manner of Moses, follow Moses' manner, follow his law, you cannot be saved. Now, they knew that the Jewish people could be saved just by believing in Christ because they were already circumcised, because they already had the law. But for a Gentile, they had to first become Jewish. And there's a huge debate in the church in Acts chapter 15, and they stand up and they set the results. They say, no, that's not true. There's another difference here that we find in the, in the book of Acts that takes place. If you were to look at Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 20, let's say ch chapter 22, or chapter 28, there's a huge difference in the beginning of Acts and the end of Acts. And the difference is this, the Holy Spirit. The people in the beginning of Acts did not have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. The people in the end of Acts did have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Acts chapter, or John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but ye know him, for he dwells with you. He shall be, future tense, he shall be in you. Please understand, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. <coughs> if you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, you cannot have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Now there's a difference between Acts 1 and Acts 28. Number one, he was with them, but he was not in them. He came at Pentecost, he indwelt them. But he came at different times in the book of Acts. He came to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came to the Samaritan in, in Acts chapter 8. And he indwelled the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So the Holy Spirit comes at three different times in the book of Acts. Why is that? <coughs> because there were no Samaritans saved in Acts chapter 2. They're only Jews. The Samaritans aren't saved until Acts chapter 8. There aren't any Gentiles saved in Acts chapter 2. The Gentiles aren't saved until Acts chapter 10. But in all of these instances, Peter is the one that's used to lay his hands on the people and the Holy Spirit comes upon the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. You say, that's weird. That doesn't happen today. I know it doesn't happen today. The Jewish people had to accept the Gentiles. They had to see that the Gentiles received the same gift of the Holy Spirit as the Jews. Therefore, God gave to them tongues, just like He did to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. He gave to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So they could see that it's the same Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit has come to the Gentiles, and they believed it. <coughs> However, in, Acts, in Romans 8 9, the Bible says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. We all have the Holy Spirit today, but there's a difference. Okay. Let me just do some, some just talking to you for a little bit here. These matters are huge in the church that we live in, the churches today. This is huge. There are many, many, many churches that get their doctrine from Acts chapter 2, from Acts chapter 8, from Acts chapter 10, from Acts chapter 19. They... Pick out the doctrines, but Acts is a transition book from one dispensation, from one covenant to another covenant, from one dispensation to another dispensation. There was a time period in the book of Acts when they did not have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. 
then there was a time period in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit was indwelling them. The beginning of Acts is not the same as what it is today for our church. It's different. There was no power in them in Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. They did not have the power. Listen to this, this verse, Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When did the Holy Ghost come upon them? Well, Acts chapter 2. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost come, has come upon you. So did they have that power in Acts chapter 1? Well, no, they did not. So we have an issue here. Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Peter and the first decision. I want you to think about this. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look, please, at Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. Acts chapter 1, verse 21. We read these words. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time the Lord Jesus went in, out and went in among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay, Peter is saying this. Follow me here. Jesus said you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There are only 11 of us. There's only 11 thrones. We've got to fill the 12th throne. The problem is, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't you realize that we have to help the Lord usher in the kingdom? We can't have a kingdom because there's only 11 of us. <coughs> We've got to have the 12th one. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's going to happen at any time. But we don't have a twelfth apostle. We've got to have a twelfth apostle. So Peter says, let's do that. What is the problem here? <laughs> As I said to you, there's no power yet. The Holy Spirit has not come upon them yet. So he says this, Wherefore of these men which have company with us, all the time the Lord Jesus went out in among us, beginning from the baptism of John, there must one be ordained to be a witness of his resurrection. We've got to find someone who was with us from the very beginning to now that we can appoint as an apostle. And they appointed two, one called Joseph and the other named Matthias. And they prayed, said, Thou, Lord, which knows the heart of men, show us which... And they draw lots, and they choose by lots which one would be the, the, the twelfth apostle. Are you following me? Lots were from the Old Testament. It is the way God dealt with people in the Old Testament was with the Urim and the Thummim. Where is the Urim and the Thummim today? We've got a problem here because Peter, the Holy Spirit has not yet come upon him. He's going back to the Old Testament way of doing things. We've got to do it this way because we don't have a Holy Spirit guiding us or teaching. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, and that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.